Dear guests, the Prime Minister of Iceland. Distinguished colleagues, dear guests, it's a pleasure and a privilege to welcome you to Iceland to the Reykjavik Summit of the Council of Europe. Bienvenue à tous. Depuis sa fondation, le Conseil d'Europe a servi comme organisation directrice fondamentale à ses membres pour faire progresser les droits de l'homme, la démocratie et l'état de droit. Sur le principe fondamental de l'égalité des droits de tous, quelles qui sont soit les circonstances, reste une notion radicale pour quelques-uns. Il constitue la base de la Convention des droits de l'homme. And it is to that core mission that the Parliamentary Assembly, the European Court of Human Rights, the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities, the missions in Strasbourg and the Secretariat, and our institutions and missions are dedicated. However, we are not gathered here in celebration, but under the clouds of war. Russia's aggression against Ukraine is the gravest assault on peace and security in Europe since, since the Second World War. In addition to huge military casualties, it has led to massacres, rapes, and murders of civilians. To the people of Ukraine and to President Zelensky, I want to say this. We have tremendous respect for your determination to resist, and we will continue to stand with you and to call on Russia to withdraw its forces from Ukraine as the first step towards ending this war. We also demand accountability and a just peace. The victims of this war have a right to be heard and not to be subjected to oblivion. This senseless war in our continent is contrary to all the values for which we united with the founding of this Council. It's a grave assault on the very principles that make Europe more than just a continent, but a common cause. Dear colleagues, in recent years, we have witnessed increasing political attempts to undermine basic values, subvert democratic, democratic practices, and weaken the rule of law. Democracy has come under strain due to various forms of, of authoritarian encroachments. And we are facing a widespread and violent pushback against women's rights and freedoms, gender equality, and LGBTI rights. We should not forget that the democratic concept that underpins the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Social Charter is inclusive. It requires that the rights and interests of all are considered, including those most vulnerable to violations of their basic rights. The very concept of human rights for everyone continues to be contested, and without firm resistance, hard-earned rights can disappear in an instant or wither away in silence. It's also a reminder that a democratic political system is not a given. It can survive only if it's embedded in a society that allows it to prosper. The Reykjavik Summit has three main objectives. First, to reaffirm our support for Ukraine, to adopt concrete measures to address accountability for war crimes, and to strengthen the Council of Europe's role as a leading human rights organization. Second, to renew in general terms our commitment to the democratic human rights values that our societies are based on and that must be nurtured and protected. And lastly, by recommitting to our values, we seek to meet pressing global challenges. The climate and the biodiversity crisis is affecting all parts of the world, with rising temperatures fueling natural disasters, food and water insecurity, economic disruptions and wars. The exponential growth of artificial intelligence raises profound questions about its detrimental as well as its beneficial effects, about the nature of knowledge production, control of information, and ultimately its influence on democracy. We have a duty to make this gathering a meaningful undertaking. We are here to discuss problems that need urgent action and let us make the most of this opportunity. To conclude, I hope that the Reykjavik Summit will be remembered as an event when European leaders stood in solidarity with Ukraine, as well as a venue for reaffirming core values in a time of war and democratic backsliding. 
to ensure that our common cause, Europe, will be able to meet the enormous challenges ahead. And with these words, I declare the Reykjavik Summit of the Council of Europe formally open. And now it's my great honor to introduce the next speaker who is joining us online from Kiev. President Zelensky, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Prime Minister Yago's daughter, dear Catherine. Thank you for invitation to participate in the summit of our Council of Europe and for your sincere desire to help Ukraine. Dear leaders of Europe, today Ukraine went through a difficult challenge, an intense Russian missile attack. Such challenges are what we all have to pay attention to now. At three o'clock in the morning, our people woke up to explosions. 18 Russian missiles of different types were in our sky in particular. Ballistic ones, which the terrorist state has boasted about. We were told such missiles would bring a guaranteed death because they are supposedly impossible to shut down. Russia used ballistics, cruise missiles, drones at the same time to make it especially difficult for our defense to save lives. But all lives were protected. All missiles were shut down, including ballistic ones. 100%. This is a historical result. Thank you all. Russia is trying very hard to improve its ability to kill. We are trying very hard to improve the protection of our people. And I thank all the countries and leaders who help us to improve our air defense. Altogether, we are showing what our 100% mean and what the power of the free world means. And of course, I thank every our soldier who makes this job done in our skies and on a land. And especially, I thank each and every who trains our warriors in different train missions, which are all similar in one point in success. Thanks. To all of them, thanks to all of you. A year ago, we were not able to shoot down most of the terrorist missiles, especially ballistic ones. And I'm asking one thing now. If we are able to do this, is there anything we can't do when we are united and determined to protect lives? The answer that we in unity will give 100% in any field when we have a goal to protect our people and our Europe. And of course, there is still much to be done. Ukraine's territory is big and to make air defense results like last night's the rule throughout the country, we need additional air defense systems and missiles. We also need modern fighter jets without which no air defense system will be perfect, and I'm sure we will get there. 100% should be our benchmark. We must leave 0% to the aggressor. 100% of success of defense operations is guaranteed by weapons and training of our soldiers. And I thank everyone who strengthens our defense. 100% of success of sanctions is guaranteed by honesty in every state policy. And I'm grateful to all those who threat the fight against terror in this way, honestly. 100% of success of our peace formula is guaranteed by diplomacy. And I thank everyone who helps us unite the world to implement the peace formula, the only realistic 
this plan and of course 100 percent of justice and there will be no reliable peace without justice and i thank the council of europe each and every of you personally for the decision of the register of damages caused by russia's aggression this brings closer the creation of a full-fledged compensation mechanism that will show the world that aggression is not worth even thinking about. There should also be a special tribunal for the crime of aggression so that those whose heads this terror was born in are brought to responsibility. And I'm sure that we will provide this result for 100%. Europe has been waiting for such times, times when leaders would act in 100% unity and with 100% results for the sake of protecting Europe, for the sake of our common values. And finally, this is what we are achieving now. Ukraine, all of Europe, and everyone who is currently at this summit and who helps us, we are Europeans, so we are free. We are Europeans, so we value peace. We are Europeans, so we act at 100% of our strengths when it comes to protecting our way of life. Let this be forever the rules of our continent. Thank you for support. Slava Ukraini. Glory to Europe. Mesdames et Messieurs les chefs d'État et de gouvernement, Madame la Première Ministre, chère Catherine, Madame la Secrétaire Générale du Conseil de l'Europe, Monsieur le Président du Conseil européen, Madame la Présidente de la Commission européenne, Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, Mesdames et Messieurs les ambassadeurs, Mesdames et Messieurs en vos grades et qualités. La cadence des sommets du Conseil de l'Europe le montre. Les quatre rencontres organisées en plus de 70 ans indiquent que notre rassemblement aujourd'hui intervient à un moment de bascule et d'inflexion pour notre continent. Aussi, je remercie la présidence islandaise d'avoir pris l'initiative de ce sommet. Merci, Madame la Première Ministre, de nous accueillir à Reykjavik dans ce moment crucial où nous devons en effet porter nos efforts pour conserver ce qui nous lie face aux bouleversements géopolitiques, mais aussi technologiques et anthropologiques qui secouent notre époque. Je suis venu ici exprimer la conviction partagée, je le sais, par chacun ici, que notre conception européenne de l'humanisme, fondée sur le droit et la liberté, est non seulement nécessaire, mais vivante et forte. Nous disposons d'autres enceintes pour échanger sur les conflits armés, sur les grands équilibres stratégiques et la communauté politique européenne que nous avons fondée à Prague et qui nous réunira à nouveau à Kisnao est un lieu qui nous permet de vrai pleinement à tout cela. Mais un seul lieu nous permet d'agir pour la sécurité démocratique de notre continent, le Conseil de l'Europe. Il demeure la maison solide de la démocratie, de l'État de droit, des droits de l'homme pour les citoyens européens. Et il doit continuer à les protéger face aux nouvelles menaces, celles que le changement climatique fait peser sur la protection des droits de l'homme, comme celles qui accompagnent l'émergence d'un monde entièrement repensé par le numérique et de plus en plus par l'intelligence artificielle. Et face à cette convergence des périls, je souhaite que notre Conseil continue de se concentrer sur sa mission de protection de la démocratie et des droits de l'homme. Cet espace de droit est aussi affirmé parce que la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme, fermant d'une communauté juridique européenne, en constitue la clé de voûte. Dès lors, il est indispensable que ces arrêts soient appliqués, sans exception, et nous en prendrons l'engagement grâce à une déclaration et une feuille de route commune. 
Cet espace de droit peut et doit aussi continuer à travailler en bonne intelligence avec d'autres comme l'Union européenne. Cette complémentarité est évidente. Dans toutes ces missions, le Conseil sait pouvoir compter sur l'engagement de la France pour demeurer un pilier de la défense des libertés fondamentales. La République, pour nos concitoyens, garantit les droits et libertés. Nous avons ainsi fait avancer la prévention et la lutte contre les violences faites aux femmes. Nous continuerons d'œuvrer pour l'égalité, quel que soit le genre ou l'orientation sexuelle. Et nous déclinerons et continuerons d'agir avec force contre le racisme, l'antisémitisme et les discriminations liées à l'origine. La France est aussi déterminée à porter ce combat en dehors de nos frontières. Et il s'agit d'un axe majeur de notre politique de solidarité internationale. Nous portons ce combat pour nos valeurs au sein des enceintes multilatérales, que ce soit contre la peine de mort, en relançant en 2021 une initiative pour l'abolition universelle de celle-ci, en faveur de l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes pour soutenir la ratification de la Convention d'Istanbul, ou encore pour les droits LGBT+, et en particulier la dépénalisation de l'homosexualité, nous le redirons haut et fort demain à l'occasion de la journée internationale de lutte contre l'homophobie, la lesbophobie, la transphobie et la biphobie. Notre communauté européenne de valeurs est forte, enfin, de ce que 70 ans de dialogue et d'œuvres juridiques ont accompli. Une institution incarnant la réconciliation, à laquelle fait écho la ville symbole de Strasbourg où siège le Conseil, incarnant la conversation perpétuelle des pensées et du multilinguisme, avec entre autres la langue française au cœur de son système, incarnant l'union des peuples européens au-delà des blessures de nos guerres. Et c'est sans doute parce qu'il a été pensé comme le remède à la guerre et aux périls autoritaires, sans doute aussi parce qu'il est fort de cet héritage que le Conseil de l'Europe s'est montré à la hauteur du moment et de l'histoire. En effet, le Conseil de l'Europe a réagi rapidement et fermement à l'agression de l'Ukraine. La Russie avait choisi souverainement de rejoindre notre institution, au même titre que l'Ukraine. Le Conseil a ainsi incarné la possibilité d'une autre voie, celle du dialogue entre ces deux pays. Et si la Russie a pris de son seul fait la décision d'agresser l'Ukraine, dès lors le Conseil a mis la Russie face à ses responsabilités en l'excluant dès le 16 mars 2022, à raison. Dès le début de la guerre aussi, le Conseil s'est mobilisé pour soutenir l'Ukraine et l'aider à documenter les exactions commises par la Russie. Je pense au bombardement d'infrastructures civiles, aux viols utilisés comme armes de guerre, aux meurtres, à la torture généralisée, aux déportations d'enfants ukrainiens. À l'occasion de ce sommet, le Conseil montre de nouveau la voie aux côtés des victimes de l'agression en créant aujourd'hui un registre international des dommages causés par l'agression de la Russie contre l'Ukraine. J'appelle tous les États à y adhérer et à contribuer activement à son élaboration. Notre Conseil s'est aussi mobilisé en faveur des enfants ukrainiens, ceux qui ont cherché la sécurité sur nos territoires à qui nous devons protection et assistance, ceux qui ont été déportés, enlevés, arrachés à leur foyer, à leurs proches, livrés à des inconnus. Les transferts forcés d'enfants sont des crimes de guerre et généralisés peuvent constituer des crimes contre l'humanité. La Russie doit rendre ses enfants à l'Ukraine et elle doit le faire immédiatement. C'est pourquoi je le redis devant vous et je sais que vous partagez cet engagement nous continuerons à apporter notre soutien indéfectible à l'Ukraine, membre de notre famille démocratique européenne, autant qu'il le faudra. L'expertise technique reconnue du Conseil en matière juridique et institutionnelle soutiendra ainsi la résilience de l'Ukraine. Nous le savons, l'Ukraine a également besoin d'un appui financier. La Banque de développement du Conseil de l'Europe dispose d'un positionnement unique pour aider le pays est pour financer la reconstruction d'écoles, d'hôpitaux, de maternités en Ukraine. Je propose que nous puissions lancer un grand projet pour qu'elle puisse au plus vite intervenir et appuyer l'installation d'une centaine de centres de santé mentale en Ukraine pour venir en aide à tous ceux qui subissent au quotidien les lourds traumatismes 
que cause ce violent conflit et comme l'ont demandé les Ukrainiennes et Ukrainiens eux-mêmes. La Banque pourra ainsi se porter également auprès des autres États de la région qui doivent faire face aux pressions déstabilisatrices de la Russie et ont accueilli des milliers de réfugiés. Le Conseil de l'Europe, nous le voyons, a devant lui les périls du siècle. Rien ne doit entamer notre optimisme lucide, ni notre, notre détermination, nous, grande famille démocratique européenne. C'est ici et ensemble que nous continuerons à défendre la liberté d'expression, les élections libres, les médias libres, l'indépendance de la justice, la lutte contre la corruption, que nous continuerons à soutenir sans relâche les Ukrainiennes et les Ukrainiens et que nous ferons grandir la dignité humaine en éradiquant la torture ou les traitements dégradants, que nous combattrons dans le monde entier la peine de mort. En un mot, nous serons toujours ensemble et résolu pour défendre l'humanisme européen pour nous et pour tous ceux qui entendent cet appel universel. Je vous remercie. Dear guests, the Federal Chancellor of Germany. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, meine Damen und Herren, als der ehemalige französische Premierminister Edouard Herriot im August 1949 die beratende Versammlung des Europarats eröffnete, waren die Wunden des Zweiten Weltkriegs noch ganz frisch. Herriot sprach vom Recht der geballten Faust, vom Kult der Gewalt, der unseren Kontinent ausgehend von Deutschland in Schutt und Asche gelegt hatte. Umso klarer war für Eriot und die anderen Väter und Mütter des Europarats, was sie diesem Unrecht der geballten Faust künftig entgegensetzen wollten. Die Stärke des Rechts über die politische und kulturelle Grenzen hinweg. Die Überzeugung, dass Macht an Regeln und Gesetze gebunden sein muss und das Versprechen, dass alle Bürgerinnen und Bürger gleich sind in ihren Rechten und Pflichten. Erio und seine Generation hatten am eigenen Leib erlebt, es gibt einen untrennbaren Zusammenhang zwischen Rechtsstaatlichkeit, Demokratie und dem Schutz der Menschenrechte auf der nationalen Ebene und dem friedlichen Miteinander auf der internationalen Ebene. Der Krieg, mit dem Deutschland Europa und die Welt überzog, wurde erst möglich, weil die Nationalsozialisten zuvor Demokratie, Gewaltenteilung und Menschenrechte in Deutschland auslöschen konnten. Wer diesen Zusammenhang einmal erkannt hat, der begreift, der Europarat ist heute so wichtig wie wohl niemals zuvor. Am 24. Februar vergangenen Jahres hat Russland die Ukraine überfallen, um Territorium zu erobern und Grenzen mit Gewalt zu verschieben. Deshalb war es richtig, ja vollkommen unumgänglich, Russland aus dem Europarat auszuschließen. Auch die Zusammenarbeit des Europarats mit Belarus haben wir aufgrund der Unterstützung des russischen Angriffskriegs durch das Minsker Regime zu Recht suspendiert. Und um auch das klar zu sagen, dass sich in Russland antidemokratische, autoritäre Entwicklungen durchsetzen konnten, spricht nicht gegen den Europarat, sondern dafür, dass wir unsere gemeinsamen Regeln künftig noch ernster nehmen, dass wir sie als Frühwarnsystem verstehen für den Friedenserhalt in Europa. Konkret folgt daraus zweierlei. Erstens, jedes unserer Länder muss seinen Pflichten als Mitglied des Europarats nachkommen, ohne Abstriche. Dazu zählt, dass wir alle Urteile des Europäischen Gerichtshofs für Menschenrechte konsequent umsetzen. Wir müssen eine vermeintliche Niederlage vor dem Gerichtshof in Straßburg in Wahrheit als Gewinn für Menschenrechte und bürgerliche Freiheiten begreifen, und zwar überall in Europa und dank der Vorbildfunktion des Gerichtshofs sogar oft überall auf der Welt. Der Europarat war weltweit oft Pionier, wenn es darum ging, unsere Demokratien, unsere Rechtsstaaten auf die Herausforderungen der Zukunft vorzubereiten. 
Das sollte er bleiben, etwa wenn es um den Schutz von Menschenrechten im Digitalzeitalter geht oder um die Durchsetzung des Rechts auf eine gesunde Umwelt. Mein zweiter Punkt betrifft die Lehren, die wir als Europarat aus Russlands Angriff auf Europas Friedensordnung ziehen. Im Zentrum steht dabei, die Ukraine mit aller Kraft auf ihren demokratischen europäischen Weg zu unterstützen. Bei der Verteidigung gegen die russische Aggression, bei der Sicherstellung rechtsstaatlicher Institutionen, beim Wiederaufbau, zum Beispiel auch über die Entwicklungsbank des Europarats und durch Kapazitätsaufbau im Justizwesen. Der Europarat ist auch wichtig, um die Kriegsverbrechen der russischen Besatzer zu ahnden und Rechenschaft einzufordern für die enormen Schäden, die Russland der Ukraine Tag für Tag zufügt. Das Schadensregister, das wir hier in Reykjavik gemeinsam auf den Weg bringen wollen, spielt dabei eine zentrale Rolle. Eine Lehre der Zeitenwende ist auch, dass wir den Beitritt der Ukraine aber natürlich auch der Westbalkanstaaten Moldaus und perspektivisch Georgiens zur Europäischen Union voranbringen wollen. Auch dabei kommt dem Europarat eine wichtige Rolle zu, nicht zuletzt dank der großen Expertise der Venedig-Kommission. Und schließlich muss der Europarat alles daran setzen, dass Demokratie, Menschenrechte und Rechtsstaatlichkeit irgendwann tatsächlich überall in Europa Fuß fassen. Mit Blick auf Russland und Belarus mag das heute nahezu unvorstellbar klingen. Doch irgendwann wird Russlands Krieg gegen die Ukraine enden. Und eines ist sicher. Er wird nicht mit einem Sieg des putinschen Imperialismus enden. Denn wir werden die Ukraine so lange unterstützen, bis ein gerechter Frieden erreicht ist. Bis dahin sollten wir als Europarat Brücken aufrechterhalten zu den Vertretern und Vertretern eines anderen Russlands, eines anderen Belarus und so die Perspektive einer demokratischen, friedlichen Zukunft beider Länder offen halten, so unwahrscheinlich sie uns heute auch erscheinen mag. Dies entspricht der Gründungsidee des Europarats, wonach Freiheit und Demokratie und Rechtsstaatlichkeit im Innern Hand in Hand gehen mit Frieden nach außen. Das entspricht auch unserem Anspruch, Freiheit und Frieden überall auf unserem Kontinent zu sichern, für jede Bürgerin und jeden Bürger. Vielen Dank. Dear guests. The President of the Council of Ministers of the Italian Republic. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Voglio ovviamente ringraziare il primo ministro e il governo islandese per questa ospitalità, ma soprattutto per la determinazione con la quale hanno lavorato perché questo vertice del Consiglio d'Europa, la cui idea nasce a Torino nella riunione conclusiva durante la presidenza italiana, diventasse realtà. Voglio ovviamente salutare la Segretaria Generale, i Presidenti, i primi ministri qui presenti e tutti voi. Sono passati 18 anni dall'ultimo vertice del Consiglio d'Europa. E sono molti, ma non tanti quanti sembrano se guardiamo a quanto da allora è mutato il contesto che ci circonda. La brutale aggressione russa all'Ucraina ha messo in discussione molte certezze sulle quali noi per troppo tempo ci eravamo ingenuamente adagiati. Ed è giusto che un atto così grave sia condannato proprio qui, dal Consiglio d'Europa, la casa di tutti gli europei, costruita con il compito preciso di evitare il ripetersi delle atrocità della Seconda Guerra Mondiale, difendendo la democrazia e difendendo il diritto, quel diritto degli Stati senza il quale noi non possiamo difendere il diritto degli uomini. 
Il popolo ucraino con la sua eroica reazione all'invasione non sta difendendo solamente la sua patria, sta difendendo i valori fondanti dell'identità europea, la libertà, la democrazia, la giustizia, l'uguaglianza tra gli uomini. Se l'Ucraina fosse capitolata, se l'avesse fatto in pochi giorni, come molti prevedevano, noi oggi vivremmo un mondo molto più insicuro. Non vivremmo una realtà di pace, come racconta quella propaganda così cinica da fingere di scambiare un'invasione con la parola pace. Noi vivremmo un mondo nel quale alla forza del diritto si sostituisce il diritto del più forte e quel mondo è un mondo che non conviene a nessuno. E questa è la ragione per la quale al Presidente Zelensky voglio dire che l'intera Europa e tutto il mondo libero sono loro debitori. Anche in questo intervento il Presidente Zelensky ha detto molto spesso grazie, ci ha ringraziato per come noi stiamo aiutando l'Ucraina, ma io voglio dire al Presidente Zelensky che siamo noi a essere debitori dell'Ucraina perché l'Ucraina con la sua determinazione ha fatto capire al mondo intero quanto possa essere difficile piegare un popolo libero. E per questo noi faremo la nostra parte, per garantire all'Ucraina il futuro di libertà, di integrità, di democrazia che merita, il futuro europeo che merita. Per questo l'Italia ha, tra le altre cose, immediatamente aderito all'accordo promosso dal Consiglio d'Europa per istituire il registro dei danni causati dalla guerra, perché non vi sia impunità. E per questo non potevo non essere qui a testimoniare l'impegno dell'Italia per difendere il diritto internazionale e per difendere i valori fondanti della nostra comune identità europea, partendo dal principio fondamentale dal quale discendono tutti gli altri. E quel principio è la centralità della persona, il rispetto di ogni singolo essere umano, della sua sacra unicità. Ed è questo un valore che noi oggi siamo chiamati a proteggere su molti fronti, dalle antiche sfide fatte di violenza e sopraffazione, ma anche dalle nuove sfide della nostra epoca. Mai come in questo tempo la scienza e la tecnologia corrono veloci. Penso all'ingegneria genetica, all'intelligenza artificiale, alle questioni bioetiche. Penso al rischio che correremmo se dovessimo considerare questi domini delle zone franche senza regole. Il rischio, cioè, di un progresso non più volto a rafforzare e ampliare le capacità umane, ma un progresso in cui le capacità umane vengono sostituite, surrogate, in un mondo sempre più dominato dall'ineguaglianza, dalla concentrazione di potere e di ricchezza nelle mani di, poche, di pochi. E un mondo dominato dall'uguaglianza non è un mondo democratico e dunque non è un mondo europeo. Oggi più che mai noi siamo chiamati a ribadire la difesa della dignità umana in ogni contesto, perché questa è l'Europa, una roccaforte di valori costruita nei millenni, la nostra vera, unica forza dinanzi alla violenza dei tiranni, ma anche dinanzi ai nuovi pericoli che vivono le nostre società. Nel 1949 dieci nazioni, tra cui l'Italia, diedero vita al Consiglio d'Europa, una decisione che nasceva dalla convinzione che la tutela dei valori fondamentali di libertà, democrazia e dignità umana fosse la base per una prosperità condivisa e pacifica in Europa. Oggi siamo in 46 e siamo qui, riuniti a Reykjavik, per dire con forza che la nostra missione ora è più attuale che mai. Vi ringrazio. Dear guests, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom.
addressing a huge crowd on the streets of Strasbourg in 1949. Winston Churchill, one of the founding fathers of this council, spoke about le génie de l'Europe. He was talking about what makes our continent so successful, the values of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. The same spirit we've seen again and again that led Vaclav Havel to broadcast his messages of freedom during the suppression of the Prague Spring, that brought down the Berlin Wall, and that leads Ukraine to defend its sovereignty with such valour, inspiring us to stand with them all. The Council of Europe has nurtured that spirit for three quarters of a century, and it must do so again now because today we are facing the greatest threat to democracy and the rule of law on our continent since before the Treaty of London was signed. With Russia waging a war of aggression on European soil and China growing in assertiveness, the world is becoming more contested and more volatile. The challenge to our values is growing, and the moment to push back is now. Democracies like ours must build resilience so that we can out-cooperate and out-compete those who drive instability. That's why we're working so closely with our friends across Europe, through the G7, NATO, the Joint Expeditionary Force, the European political community, and with a welcome new tone in our relations with the European Union. Friends the United Kingdom may have left the EU but we have not left Europe. We remain a proud European nation, and we must work together to defend the values we all hold so dear. The Council of Europe, with its huge reach, has such a vital role to play. And we need to think about how this Council should react to the realities of today. We showed great purpose in expelling Russia last year acting decisively together within days of the invasion. And let's bring that dynamism to the issues before us now. And let's send a message from this hall, loud and clear, that we will stand by Ukraine for as long as it takes. We will hold Russia accountable for the horrendous war crimes that have been committed. And we must also learn the lessons of this war by being prepared to confront threats to our societies before they become too big to deal with. That includes acting on cybersecurity and AI, and it means tackling illegal migration. The moral case for action is clear. We can't just sit back and watch as criminal gangs profiteer on people's misery. Illegal migration exploits the most vulnerable, it risks crowding out those with a genuine case for asylum. And it strains the trust that our citizens have, not just in our domestic borders, but in the international system. And that's why so many of us are already acting at the national level, and why we need to do more to cooperate across borders and across jurisdictions to end illegal migration and stop the boats. The Council already plays a vital role, but I urge leaders to consider how we can go further, because we know what we can achieve together. Just look at this Council's extraordinary legacy, protecting human rights, abolishing the death penalty in Europe, supporting media freedom, and championing democracy across Central and Eastern Europe after the Cold War. So let's take heart from that and keep rising to the many challenges before us, true to our enduring values and certain that, as Churchill went on to tell the Strasbourg crowd, the dangers before us are great, but great too is our strength. Thank you. Dear guests, the President of the Republic of Poland. Uh, 
Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, the Council of Europe was established at a very special time and with a very concrete goal. It was a moment when the whole world, and Europe in particular, was just overcoming the horrors of the war. The old world was set on fire by imperialism and national egoisms. They implied, among others, lack of respect for freedom of citizens, the value of human life, the rule of law and democracy. The Council of Europe was set up to defend those very values. They unite us and provide the foundation for our unique community. We need to bear in mind when we start our discussion today. We are a community of values and it's our duty to defend them. Ladies and gentlemen, the summits of the Council of Europe do not take place every year. Neither do they take place on a regular basis. They are held at crucial and historic moments which require a deeper reflection on the values that underpin our organization. Especially the first summit in Vienna in 1993, in October, soon after the fall of the Iron Curtain, and the third summit in Warsaw in 2005, which followed the biggest enlargement of the European Union, took place moments of strategic importance for the future of Europe. This is the case also today. Unfortunately, the summit in Reykjavik is taking place at the time of the largest attack on democratic values since the fall of totalitarian regimes on the old continent. With its invasion of Ukraine, Russia wants not only to destroy the country, it also wants to revise all the values which form the basis of the Council of Europe. Let us remember that Putin's plan includes, in its wider context, the construction of a different order, an order based on values contrary to ours. In such a world, democracy becomes an empty notion. What matters is just naked force. Human rights are only a facade, as every citizen can be sentenced to tens of years in a penal colony or lose their life for any reason. All of us here must be fully aware of this. At previous summits, our countries debated on the directions of development after the spectacular triumphs of democracy. Today, we are meeting at the critical moment when Russia, a member state of the Council of Europe just a year ago, together with its vassal Lukashenko, is attacking the whole free world. We must not yield to that. We have to be even stronger and more united. Let's use this moment to boost our identity and unity. We have an opportunity to express it at the commencing debates. That's why the declaration which we are going to adopt here is so crucial. It confirms, first of all, our joint responsibility and determination to support Ukraine as long as it takes. An issue of equal importance will be the one to establish the register of damages inflicted on Ukraine by the Russian aggression. It's an important step to hold to account those guilty of crimes committed in Ukraine. Crimes have to be accounted for it's of key importance to compensate the victims and their loved ones, but it's also a precondition for peace and stability in future. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, 
let me remind the words which I said on many occasions before. Today, it's Ukraine who sheds its blood and gives lives in the name of the values which underpin our identity. We, the free world, must be determined to support them in this fight. Without such support, all our declarations will remain void. Thank you. Dear guests, the President of the European Commission. Prime Minister, dear Katrin, first of all, thank you so much for hosting us in this lively and vibrant city of Reykjavik. Presidents and Prime Ministers, Secretary General, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Today, war is back in Europe. But for many Ukrainians, this conflict began already 10 years ago. It began when peaceful protesters, just waving the European flags in Maidan Square, were shot dead by snipers. It began with Russia's first invasion of Crimea and Donbass in 2014. Sakharov Prize winner Alexandra Matvichuk is one of these Ukrainians. She started documenting human rights violations by the regime and by Russian troops already a decade ago. She spent countless nights listening to the victims and to their families. Alexandra and her friends at the Ukrainian Center for Civil Liberties have never stopped fighting for democracy, for human rights, for a free and independent Ukraine. For over 10 long years, and that's why they were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize as we gather here in Iceland, allow me to quote Alexandra's words. She said, It is to stop Ukraine's progress towards genuine democracy that Russia invaded. It is not NATO that Putin fears. It is democracy. This is a war of values. Russia is fighting against the values that are Europe's hallmark, and Europe must take responsibility." End of quote. She is so right. Ukraine is fighting for the values we believe in and we hold so dearly. And I'm so grateful that we are united in protecting peace and promoting democracy. Because this is the very reason why the Council of Europe was created. And this is what brings us here today. As Russia wages war against democracy itself, Europe is united in standing up for Ukraine. This is our commitment. Rightly so. The Ukrainian people are demanding accountability for Russia's war crimes, the shelling of civilian homes, the executions in cold blood, the abduction of children from their families. Over 19,000 children have been stolen, torn away from their families. This is what the summit of Iceland should focus on. This is why we are here to discuss these topics. It is important for Ukrainians today because the prospect of accountability can already deter Russian soldiers from committing new war crimes. But it is also important for the future because only justice can be the foundation of lasting peace in Ukraine. A just 
peace. Ladies and gentlemen, since the creation of the Council of Europe, our continent has embarked on a journey towards democracy. We rebuilt not only our cities, but also the moral foundations of Europe. We have put freedom, equality, and solidarity at the heart of our societies. Our journey has continued as more and more European countries moved from dictatorship to democracy, and that journey continues today. It continues inside our countries. Whenever human rights and the rule of law are challenged, it continues in Ukraine and in every place where people are taking to the streets and waving the flag of our common values. And today, we recommit to these values. We will do everything possible so that Ukraine wins the peace, a just peace. And we will do nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. This is why we strongly support Ukraine's peace formula. The Ukrainian peace formula is the foundation of their path towards peace. And that is why I call on us at this summit to really rally behind this peace formula. In these testing times, it is so important that we all join forces. The Ukrainians are fa fighting for democracy and for freedom. It is our common fight, and we stand by their side for as long as it takes. Slava, Ukraine. Long live Europe. Dear guests, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe. Mesdames et Messieurs les Présidents, Mesdames et Messieurs les Premiers Ministres, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, lorsque le Conseil de l'Europe a été créé, C'était au lendemain d'une guerre mondiale dévastatrice. Les fondateurs de notre organisation étaient déterminés qu'une telle violence soit reléguée au passé, que la paix soit fondée sur une plus grande unité des États membres. Depuis 1949, notre organisation a créé un espace juridique commun où s'applique la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme et où une Cour l'a fait respecter au bénéfice de chaque citoyen. Dans l'histoire de l'humanité, aucun continent n'a jamais construit quoi que ce soit de comparable. Mais la poursuite de ce projet requiert de toute urgence votre attention. L'agression de la Fédération de Russie contre l'Ukraine est le point final terrible de la rupture de ce pays avec les valeurs et les normes européennes. This summit forms part of our response. You can answer Russia's spiral of dissent by lifting Europe up and ensuring the peace and democratic security that come when rights are respected. So I invite you to recommit to the organization's values and standards, not just in words, but by deeds. The implementation of the European Convention on Human Rights 
the unconditional execution of the court's final judgments and support for Ukraine, ensuring accountability for Russia's crimes by endorsing a register of damage, and tackling the outrageous abduction of Ukrainian children by Russia. You can take action to reverse the democratic backsliding and apply our timeless standards to contemporary challenges, such as artificial intelligence and climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe faces a choice. Let our standards fail and see Europe go backwards into the wild, or reinvest in what has brought us so much good. Now is the time to set that course for the benefit of all Europeans. Ця історія, наприклад, з Радою Європи почалася в 2013 році, коли я вперше побувала на їхньому навчанні. І для мене це був інший рівень взаємодії між людьми. І якщо ви можете робити цю молодіжну роботу, робіть. Якщо ви транслюєте якісь речі ціннісні і важливі, то якщо ви будете займатися цією молодіжною роботою, є варіант, що ви зможете вплинути і покращити якість життя цих молодих людей. Дякую за перегляд! Піаніст Вікінгур Хейлар Олафсон Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my immense honor to be here today to play for you a very special song, a song that has united the Icelandic people in times of happiness and in times of grief, a song that was written some hundred years ago by Sigvaldi Kaltalons, one of the first composers of Iceland, a song that, like all great art, belongs not to a nation, but to all nations. The song is called Ave Maria. It is a prayer, and today's performance is dedicated to the people of Ukraine, an Icelandic prayer for peace and for justice in Europe. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Wiegengut. I think every Icelander cries when we hear this song. Dear colleagues, thank you for your remarks and thank you all for being here and make this moment a meaningful moment for the future of Europe. And now we will get to work. Thank you all.